The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for that extended introduction. As you said, my name is Diego Aguirre, and I'm here today to talk to you about my doctoral work. Uh, before I start, I want to thank the ACI and the organizers of this uh, session for allowing me to share my work with you. And I also want to thank uh, the sponsors of this research. Everything uh, what you're about to see was uh, sponsored by the Alaska Department of Transportation and the Alaska Uni University Transportation Center. So before I get into the topic, which is basically performance limit states uh, for RCFST drill shafts, uh, this is the agenda that I have for today. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction, then I'm going to talk about uh, the experimental and the analytical work we did, and then I'm going to close with the topic, uh, today's topic, performance limit state for these uh, elements. So to start with, RCFST stands for reinforced concrete fill steel tubes. So basically what they are, is that they are uh, steel tubes but that are filled with reinforced concrete. And an example of this is this bridge uh, uh, in Alaska. This is the O'Malley Bridge in Anchorage, Alaska. And the columns that you see there are actually RCFSTs, meaning they're steel tubes filled with reinforced concrete. So this system uh, has uh, various uh, advantages. One of them is that it has increased strength and deformation capacities. It also allows to use the tube as a formwork, as a permanent formwork. So you can build this, these systems very fast. In this particular research, we were focusing uh, in the case where the lateral loading uh, produces the moment uh, or the plastic hinge to develop below ground. So as you can see here in this moment diagram. And just one detail to mention here, just so you have it, keep it in mind, the steel tubes here are actually cut short before they reach the cap so there is a, an actual gap between the steel tube and the, and, and the cap, and that has some consequences that you'll see there later. So this project was a follow-up of another project at NC State uh, where they tested a total of 12 piles in the air using a four-point bending test setup, <coughs> like the sketch that you see there. And this is a photograph of it, and basically what they did, they tested this under reverse cyclic loading, and they found some parameters uh, to be important, one of them to be the D over T ratio. And the other thing that they found is that you, you can actually assume um, equilibrium and strength compatibility. So they did some tests for that, and that's what we're uh, basing, that's what, what we use for our studies too. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of uh, slides from their research, just to show you, uh, to make a point. So this uh, slide is showing the progression of buckling. So as you can see here, this is for the thin wall tubes, meaning large diameter to thickness ratios. And they found that you can actually uh, see the onset of buckling at early ductility levels. This, in this case, it's ductility two, ductility three, and it continues to increase up until ductility uh, six when the steel tube ruptures. In contrast to that, you have the thick wall tubes, meaning a low diameter to thickness ratio, and if that is the case, you will only be able to see onset of buckling at large ductility levels. So in this case, we're talking about that you can actually start seeing some buckling at ductility five, and the system will fail at about ductility six, seven. In this case, it was seven. So I want you to keep that in mind. Now, moving forward to uh, the, the experimental work that I did, based on that study, we decided to test RCFSTs, but in this case, including the soil structure, structure interaction problem. And I'm just gonna mention that uh, we, in this case, we use spirally welded steel tubes filled with uh, reinforced concrete, and we left hole in the center using a PVC pipe for instrumentation purposes. So back at the lab at NC State, we have a geotechnical testing pit, which is 10 foot in diameter, 20 feet deep. And in that uh, testing pit, we embedded this soil surcharge system that we call the soil sandwich approach. And what it is, is that it's basically a set of concrete plates at the top and bottom. And in between that, we put soil and we connect the top and bottom uh, reinforced concrete plates, like 
the one like the one that you see here. And using uh, hydraulic jacks, we can actually apply pressurize on those bars, and we can effectively squeeze the soil. And by doing that, we can modify the soil stiffness, and that's what what uh, we did that because that was one of the things we wanted to do to study different soil profiles. So this is a sketch of the elevation. So you see that we connected the uh, hydraulic actuator pin connected to the to the piles, and we put that uh, into the soil in the in the lab. So one of the particular features are, of this setup is that in this uh, testing pit we have a water system here at the bottom, such that when we turn on the water, we can induce liquefaction in the soil. And by doing that, we can actually insert or we can remove the pile in a rather rapid fashion, like in 10 minutes or, or, or so. As opposed to having to remove the entire soil, remove the pile and then putting back the, pile, the new pile and then putting back the soil. So that was very, very useful. This is a photograph of one of the test setups. So you can see here our house-made hydraulic actuator and I'm, say, I'm saying house-made because uh, it has a long uh, stroke capacity which was pin connected to the specimen, so you see all the instrumentation there. Uh, in this case, we use the strain gauges. We also use uh, the optodrag system, which is basically a set of LEDs that are monitored by a, by a set of cameras. And here you can see the reinforced concrete plates with a gap in the middle, of course, to allow for the lateral movement. This is a photograph looking from the back just to show you that we uh, mounted the actuator on, on a steel uh, frame because in this portion of the lab we don't have a strong wall system. So I'm gonna show you a video of one of the tests that we conducted probably uh, a year ago or so. So the loading protocol consisted uh, of standard single cycle uh, uh, displacements and also three cycle displacements. So we started with low displacement, uh, evaluating the elastic behavior of the, of the specimens, and then we moved uh, forward with the inelastic portion using the equivalent yield displacement until eventually we run out of a stroke in the actuator or we reach failure in the specimens. So one of these tests lasted for six or seven hours. And after each test, we took uh, the pile and we examined the, the, the damage. And this picture basically correlates with the ones that I was showing you at the beginning. And basically the failure mechanism consists in uh, that as you increase the displacement or the formations, you will have tension and compression stream fibers, right? And in those uh, regions, in this case is the top and bottom here, in those regions eventually you will develop ripples in the surface until eventually onset of buckling takes place. And as you continue to increase that deformation, uh, those buckle locations continue to increase and eventually those sections are so weak that the steel ruptures at those uh, sections. So this next slide is just showing some of the results of the, all the data that I, that I got of my experiments and also the data from the previous project which is highlighted in the purple crosses here. The horizontal line is the 2.5% uh, percent limit uh, in strain in, in terms of tensile strain limits which was proposed by the previous project and which actually uh, confirmed a couple other researchers. So in particular, my data and the data of the previous project didn't show any uh, trend, but we, are, we feel comfortable to say that 2.5% 2 limit is a good uh, value, particularly since we included the soil structure interaction problem using different uh, aspect ratios for the columns. Now, this, what I just described elaborates on the behavior of pin head shafts, meaning when the maximum moment develops below ground. And now I'm, I'm gonna show you the results of the analytical study that uh, shows the behavior of the fixed head shafts. So we run analysis using uh, open seas. Uh, we run a total of 648 analysis. And what we did basically is that we uh, tested single uh, shafts, meaning just a single column, either in single bending, like the case that you see here, Right, which is the same case that I just described where the maximum moment develops somewhere below ground. And the other case when you have double bending, meaning you have a restriction at the top, meaning you're expecting moments both at top and bottom. So in this case, we use nonlinear fiber-based elements in combination with uh, PY curves. And I'm just gonna show you some of the data that we got for those parametric studies. And I'm not gonna go through all this, I'm just gonna say we use 5K side concrete in combination with API 52L uh, steel, steel for the steel tubes, and A706 grade 60 steel for the, for the rebar. 
So this is typically what they use in, in, in Alaska in their designs. These are some of the parameters uh, for the soil, just to show you that we analyzed three different soil profiles for both sand and clay. So all of those are included in the 648 simulations that I just mentioned. And so I'm gonna talk to you about the behavior of the fixed head chaff. And just to sh give you a mental picture of what I'm gonna talk about, this is an example of a bridge in Alaska. This is an actual RCFST column. And what I'm doing, or what I did in these uh, simulations, is that I took one of those uh, elements, right? And then I'm gonna apply lateral loading in the transverse direction of the bridge, meaning we're gonna have the case of double bending moments at top and bottom. Or in other words, plastic hinges at the top and plastic hinges at the bottom. So if we do that, you can do this, uh, as I said, in OpenSys or any other software, we did it in OpenSys. And I'm just showing here results for two uh, target levels. One is ductility one, or basically the equivalent yield, and ductility four, which in this particular case we found to be uh, the limit state in, for these systems. So here I'm presenting the displacement curvature and moment profiles versus depth. So depth, a depth of zero represents actually the soil surface, right? So as you increase the lateral displacement here, you will see that you have a, a concentrated uh, curvature demand at the top, but not so much at the bottom, right? And you'll see that this happens because you have sort of a hybrid system here. As I mentioned at the beginning, I said that the steel tube is cut short before the cap, meaning the tube is actually not contributing to flexure at the top. As such, at the top you effectively have a reinforced concrete section which, which has less capacity as opposed to an ingram plastic hinge here, which is effectively an RCFST. And you can also see that in terms of the moment diagram. So you see at the top, due to the large increase of displacement, you don't see um, a, a big difference in terms of the moment. But at the bottom, the moment has increased and it's actually almost twice what you see at the top. And the reason is that what, what I just mentioned. At the top, you have effectively a reinforced concrete section confined by the steel tube. But at the bottom, you have actually the steel tube contributing to flexure. So as I said, it's some sort of hybrid system. So if we zoom in into uh, the top demand or the top plastic hinge, on the left you have the curvature demand, and on the right you have the strains, and I just put this to show you a couple of things. The first is that our model approach was considering that the steel tube was not contributing anything to the, to the strength uh, of the system. And the other thing is that at ductility four, as I mentioned before, we observed uh, that was kind of the limited state for this particular system. So we were talking about that at ductility four, we're in between a damage control limit state or, a, or an ultimate limit state, which means you're very close to collapse for the plastic inch at the top. Now, if you look at the plastic inch at the bottom, you'll see that in this case, the steel tube is effectively contributing to strength, meaning you have contribution of the steel tube and the rebar. And in this particular case, these are the results for ductility four, the system has just reached yield at the bottom. So while you are very close to collapse for the plastic hinge at the top, at the bottom, the plastic hinge has just yielded, meaning you have a reserved capacity. However, you need to think, think uh, keep in mind that if you're very close to collapse at, the, collapse at the top, you can run on into a problem of instability. So you have reserved capacity at the bottom, but if you keep pushing, you have an instability issue at the top which is not bad because what this means is that you can expect damage in the top plastic hinge and not at the bottom, which is uh, actually desirable in a damage scenario uh, in which you need to repair your column. Now, moving forward to the performance limit states, uh, we wanted to produce a framework to design this type of elements using a displacement-based design approach. And what that means is that we wanted to connect strains with displacement. So, we use an equivalent cantilever approach. We adopted that, that has been done in the past for other uh, systems in combination with a plastic hinge method. So what I'm doing, or what I did is that I took a single pile, right, in a single, single bending case in which the moment distribution looks like that. And we, we're saying that we can represent that system with an equivalent fixed based uh, cantilever, which has actually two components, an elastic and a plastic component. So. That means that you have uh, elastic deformations and plastic deformations. So you can use the plastic hinge method and you can actually 
write a couple of equations for that, for which you can run parametric studies and you can uh, determine parameters for those equations based on the results of the parametric study. And that was actually what we did. Regarding the performance limit states specifically for the ingrant plastic hinge, meaning the pin head cased, we know that the steel tubes contribute to the flexural strength. We assume equ equilibrium and strain compatibility, meaning a strain, uh, linear strain profile. So it's the same way we do it for columns. You have your tensile strain, you go to curvature, and then you can go to displacement. As for the strain limits in particular, we have a couple of them for damage control and ultimate limit state. This equation here was the result of the previous research project, and this gives you actually the tensile strain prior to onset of buckling as a function of the D over T ratio. And for ultimate, as I said before, we are uh, recommending to use 2.5%, as it seems a reasonable uh, number. So if you follow the same uh, concept, you can do the same thing for a fixed head case, in which now you have a double bending case, correct? And you can represent that system also with an equivalent uh, fixed-based uh, cantilever with elastic and plastic components. But you need to recognize that at the bottom, you effectively have a reinforced concrete filled steel tube section, meaning the steel tube is contributing to the flexural strength. Whereas at the top, you effectively have a reinforced concrete section, right? So the top is going to damage. And Considering that, actually the plastic hinge model assumes that the inelastic deformations occur only at the top. And you can also write the same equations, find the parameters from a parametric study. But for the limited state, in this case, we know that it's a reinforced concrete section, but the steel tube actually provides confinement. So you need to, when you calculate the, the properties of your confined concrete, you need to keep in mind that you have a steel tube that is uh, providing confinement to the section. And for the uh, limited state curvature, you again, you use your uh, tensile strain limit, limit, and then you go to curvature, and then you can go to displacements, as we already know, for reinforced concrete sections. Regarding the strain limits, we can use um, the recommendations by the part of Los Angeles uh, document, for which, for damage control, you can use uh, about 6% of the tensile strain in the rebar, or for ultimate, you can use 8%. So just to conclude uh, my presentation, some conclusions here. The first thing is that for pinhead shafts, we observe a, a reliable uh, displacement capacity of ductility three, even for the large uh, B over T ratios. The controlling limit state is of course the uh, tensile strain of the tube of 2.5%. And one of the things that I didn't show, but it's actually important, if you use spirally welded steel tubes, you need to make sure that you have a complete joint penetration wells, otherwise you, have, you will have a very undesirable performance. For the other case, the double bending case, the displacement capacity, regardless of the soil stiffness and uh, the aspect ratio, was found to be of ductility four. The controlling um, mechanism is, failure mechanism is basically the top plastic hinge. As I said, you will expect damage at the top and just yielding of the plastic hinge at the bottom. And the controlling limit the state, of course, is the tensile strain in the rebar at the top. In this case, we, we can say that we can use the recommendations by Pola, and which is basically an 8% tensile strain in the rebar. And as I said, one thing to, important to mention, you do have in, uh, reserve capacity in the plastic hinge at the bottom, right? But as I mentioned, you need to be careful because at the top, you are very close to collapse, so you run into a problem of stability. So that's why we're limiting our displacement to ductility four. And with that, I just want to thank you all for listening to me, and I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, uh, for the in-ground hinge, yes. you assume the string compatibility, but how do you make sure the concrete and steel are perfectly bonded in that uh, hinge area? That's a very good question, actually, and I have a slide to show you. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we did this as a part of a follow-up of another project, and in that project, they actually installed instrumentation in the rebar and the tube and the concrete at a given section in the test setup that I showed you. And they run moment curvature analysis, and 
you compare experimental and uh, calculated data using this uh, modeling of this section, and they found this, this couple of uh, things. These are two examples for uh, DT of 33 or DT of 90, uh, 192. And basically, this is the moment curvature relationship for that particular experiment and the calculated uh, response, assuming equilibrium and strength compatibility. So you're very close in both, right? And I don't have the slides or the paper, but they concluded that you can actually assume equilibrium and strength compatibility. So it's not that you, you will have actually a linear strain profile. The strain profile is not linear. What they are saying is that you can actually use that and have a still good results, which is basically what you can see here in these uh, curves. The lines are very close uh, to each other between the experimental data and the analytical data. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.